Welcome. So we're looking at uh, Chapter 18 in Michigan's Money and Banking Textbook. This is looking at the role of intervention in foreign exchange markets. And so we're going to make, take a basic look at intervention. Um, and in subsequent videos, we're going to look at the mechanics of it, why uh, central banks do it, and some issues involved in thinking about exchange rate regimes. So the, the basic idea of foreign exchange intervention is that central banks are going to buy or sell uh, foreign currency, or what we call international reserves. So what we'll see is this is going to look a lot like central banks conducting open market operations, but instead of buying or selling treasuries or bonds or U.S. government bonds, they're going to be buying or selling foreign currency, or as we say, international reserves. Um, and so the basic motivation for this and thinking about why central banks might do this is that, as we'll see, it can impact exchange rate movements, and therefore that has influence on the amount of trade flows. Um, and so, as I mentioned, how central banks do this, the mechanics of it are a lot like uh, open market operations. The central banks are going to be buying or selling, um, but in this case, they're going to be buying or selling international reserves or foreign currency, the holdings that they have of foreign currency. More generally, central banks around the whole world hold uh, sums of all different kinds of foreign currency as part of the assets that it holds on its balance sheet, specifically in many cases in order to occasionally or uh, more often, more frequently, intervene in foreign exchange markets. Um, and so there's two types of intervention that uh, central banks can do. The first is what's referred to as an unsterilized intervention. So in this case, as we'll see, the intervention is going to um, essentially act like, as I said, an open market operation in a lot of ways where it influences the monetary base and it's not going to be offset. Now, that doesn't make um, um, uh, much sense right now, but we'll talk about specifically what that means. Um, and then the second type is a sterilized intervention. And in this case, the central bank is going to sort of uh, uh, reverse the process in some ways through an open market operation. And we'll talk about the reasons why that might be and the mechanics of how that actually occurs. But the important point here is that an unsterilized intervention has impacts on the monetary base, and a sterilized intervention uh, has the net effect is having no impact on the monetary base. So in terms of an unsterilized intervention, um, we can look at some different examples. So here's an example of an unsterilized intervention by the central bank. So in this case, you can think of the, the Fed, um, our central bank here. They're selling foreign currency, and they're going to be buying domestic currency. And so again, what this means is that they're, uh, they're using their, their, their store of international reserves, foreign currency, so this could be euros or yen or whatever, and they're using that to buy up uh, domestic dollars that are already floating around in, in circulation. Okay? So they're removing currency from circulation, in this case, on the order of a billion dollars, and they're trading that by offloading some of their international reserves, a billion dollars of those international reserves. So if we look at the central bank's um, uh, balance sheet, again, you can see that through this process, of this um, unster unsterilized intervention, what they're doing is they're reducing their foreign assets, their international reserves, by a billion dollars. And the flip side of that is, on the liability side, they're pulling in a billion dollars in uh, currency, in this case, uh, that's being removed from circulation. And so because of that, because of the fact that the currency is being removed from circulation, it reduces the liabilities of the Fed, in this case, by a billion dollars. And so Accounting 101, again, as we've talked about in previous videos, suggests that these, uh, the impacts on the asset and liability side should be balanced. And we have that here. And so the impact of this is such that um, the process of buying these, this domestic currency, again, removes domestic currency, in this case dollars, from circulation. The monetary base goes down, and it goes down by a billion dollars. And as a result of the multiplier process that we've talked about before, that results in a decline in the money supply. And that, of course, is contractionary. And so as a result of this, we've talked about this before, in foreign exchange markets, uh, with the contractionary policy, domestic interest rates are going to rise. That's going to result in um, uh, an appreciation of the domestic exchange rate. And so when the domestic interest rates rise, we see an increase in the demand for domestic denominated assets, and that results in an increase in the exchange rate. And of course, we've talked about the uh, effects of appreciation 
um, in previous videos that, <clears throat> excuse me, that results in a decline in net exports here. So in this case, we can um, look at uh, the opposite case. So here we have a central bank which is buying foreign currency. So they're uh, adding to its holdings of international reserves by a billion dollars. Um, and they're doing that by selling domestic currency. So in the case of the Fed, they would be uh, literally printing money and using that to buy up international reserves. So again, if we look at the Fed's balance sheet, what is happening at the, at the, on the balance sheet, you can see it's adding to its holdings of international reserves, increasing that by a billion dollars. How does it do that? How does it achieve that? Well, it prints up a billion dollars in currency and uses that to buy those international reserves. So the amount of liabilities that it's created increases by a billion dollars when it introduces that new money into the system. And if we think about the process, again, it's exactly like the example that we just looked at. When the amount of currency in circulation increases by a billion dollars, the monetary base rises by the same. We get this multiplier process, which raises the overall money supply that drives down interest rates. And when interest rates domestically go down, as we've talked about previously, the demand for d domestically denominated assets goes down because the return is lower. That results in a depreciation of the dollar exchange rate. And as a result, um, net exports increase through the mechanisms that we've talked about before. So one of the counterpoints to this is to think about the effects on the monetary base. So in the previous examples, what we saw is that when the central bank conducts these uh, interventions, it impacts the monetary base, either reducing it or increasing it. Right? And so that can have um, impacts on the broader real economy, which the central bank might want to either partially or fully um, sterilize or offset in this case. Um, and so in particular, uh, with increases in the monetary base, that can lead to increases in expansionary monetary policy, which can lead to potential inflation risk. Uh, the flip side of that is if the monetary base falls, that could be potentially contractionary. Um, and that all has impacts on interest rates, the base, and exchange rates through the mechanisms that we talked about before. So the natural question is to say, well, what if the central bank wants to intervene, but they don't want to have these uh, impacts on the broader economy? How can we deal with that? In this case, the central bank can simply uh, conduct offsetting open market operations. And that's what this sterilization process is about. So by buying and selling foreign currency and then offsetting that with an offsetting open market operation, it turns out that the central bank can adjust its portfolio of assets without impacting the monetary base. So the process um, in this example here is suppose the central bank sells foreign currency uh, by a billion dollars and they buy up a domestic currency of the same amount. Okay. Um, and so, again, the process here is the central bank is uh, using its, its store of international reserves to buy up currency that's currently in circulation. So it's removing domestic currency out of circulation, and that's going to result in a decline in the monetary base. Now, again, we've talked about this being potentially contractionary. So if the central bank doesn't want that to happen, what can it do? Well. In this case, it can offset that process. It can sterilize that, internet, inter, um, that intervention by simply conducting an offsetting open market purchase of bonds by the same amount. So in this case, it purchases a uh, billion dollars of U.S. Treasuries or something like that. Then it introduces more either currency or reserves into this, um, the system. And that in and of itself has the impact of increasing the monetary base by a billion dollars. So the process of the foreign exchange uh, intervention reduces the base by a billion. The process of the intervention with the sterilization offsets that by increasing the base by a billion. The net effect is that there's going to be no change in the monetary base. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's the point of that? It's, it's kind of pointless, right, because the monetary base doesn't change. Nothing really happens. We'll get back to that here um, momentarily. So if we look at this process, 
again, here's the intervention. So in this case here, uh, we have um, the central bank is buying a billion dollars in currency, and they're doing that by selling a billion dollars in um, international reserves. So it's drawing down its international reserves and using that to buy up uh, dollars that are floating out, out there. So that in and, of, in and of itself is going to reduce the monetary base. Now let's look at the sterilization process. The sterilization process is the central bank conducts an open market purchase of securities. Okay, So the, the Fed is buying a billion dollars worth of government securities. That process of doing that is injecting a billion dollars of either currency or reserves in the banking system. It doesn't really matter. And so if we put these two things together, the net effect, as you can see, is that the monetary base remains unchanged. So the liabilities of the central bank are unchanged. And the only thing that's happened is there's a change in the composition of the central bank's assets. So the total amount of assets hasn't changed. It's just the composition of um, those assets. So it has a billion dollars less in international reserves, and it has a billion dollars more in uh, domestic uh, securities. So um, one thing that I sort of mentioned offhand there is the, the impact um, between reserves and currency is unimportant because really the story here is in terms of the monetary base. And through this multiplier process, we know that has uh, impacts on the money supply and presumably interest rates. So that's not really the story, and it doesn't really ma um, matter the distinction of whether it's uh, buying currency or buying reserves or both. Um, that's really an unimportant part of the story. The important part here is that the monetary base is, um, uh, is always going to net out to zero if you have this perfect sterilization process occur. And what that means then is that if it's perfectly sterilized, there's going to be no interest rate and no exchange rate effects as well. And so, as I talked about before, um, liabilities are unchanged, so the total amount of assets are unchanged. The only thing that happens is there's a, distinct, a differential, perhaps, in the composition of those assets. And so a natural question to ask is, well, why would central banks actually do this? What's the point of it if nothing really changes other than um, some accounting um, uh, numbers? Um, well, there's some reasons to believe that this could be, have some impacts and, and central banks might want to do it. Um, first of all, changes in the composition of assets can have portfolio balance effects. And so what that means is that you can see changes in domestic and international assets um, in, in these markets can create changes in inf interest rate differentials. So in other words, with central banks intervening very heavily and changing the portfolio of um, these assets, that can have impacts on the interest rates in domestic economies versus international economies. So it can create these interest rate differentials, which we've talked about before, can uh, impact exchange rates. Um, but this effect is thought to be really small, and so um, uh, anecdotal evidence seems to, uh, the data seems to support that this um, effect is, is pretty small, if, if anything. The second point is that um, central banks might do this sterilization process in order to signal its intent for future policy changes. So again, the, the basic idea here, though, is that future policy changes in and of themselves are going to have to be the driving impact on interest rates in the economy. So the signals that it could potentially have changes in policy in the future aren't going to really matter. It's the actual changes in the policy that themselves that are really going to be important drivers of uh, the impacts of these uh, differentials. So, in other words, the signal effect that this could uh, be ch um, uh, changing policy at a later date is probably transitory, if best. And then the other uh, aspect, which is a lot more practical, is just the, the fact that central banks might want to diversify their portfolio. And so, in a typical sort of um, financial uh, management um, scheme, you might uh, think of uh, the central bank as a, a, an investor that just wants to diversify their risk. And so this is a, a way to mitigate some of the risk of the assets that the central bank has. So the second part of this to, is to think about, um, in terms of this intervention, um, the, the notion of balance of payments. And it turns out that these things are sort of linked, and we'll circle back around to this here um, at the end. But 
the basic idea of the balance of payments is to think about how the flow of goods and services um, flow across borders and also uh, uh, related to that are the think, uh, thinking about the income and capital flows across borders. And so there's two important pieces to this balance of payment story. The first is what's referred to as the current account and the other one is what's referred to as the capital account. And they're, they're uh, very closely related in a lot of ways. So the current ac account really reflects the effects of the flow of goods and services um, across borders. So typically we think about this as the trade balance, and this is just the total amount of exports minus imports for an economy. Um, the current account also includes things like net factor income and net cash transfers. Um, I won't go into detail what that means, but those are those tend to be fairly low, and the biggest part of this cap, uh, sorry, the current account piece here tends to be the trade balance. And so, for a lot of reasons, because of the fact that trade balance is a big chunk of this current account, those two things are thought of as being synonymous. Um, that is, if you have a, a, a current a large current account, then you have a large trade balance um, uh, in the in the negative. In fact, the second piece of this is the capital account. So the idea here is that this represents the flow of income um, and, and wealth and, and lending and other forms of capital across borders. Okay? Um, and so this is uh, things like uh, the cross-country purchases of stocks, bonds, lending, and so it's the net receipts from these capital transactions that occurs. And so the basic idea, intuitive idea to, to think about how these things are linked is imagine if a country uh, runs a trade uh, deficit. So what that means is that the current account will be negative. And so the idea is that the capital account is going to be positive by sort of roughly a similar amount. And the, the thinking of this is that, well, if you run a trade deficit, then the idea is that you need to borrow from abroad in order to be able to buy those imported goods. And so a more current, uh, a current account that's more negative, that is you have a bigger trade uh, deficit, that requires more borrowing and a higher capital account um, which is going to be more positive. Okay, so roughly speaking, those how those two things are related. <clears throat> now, how 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 do we think about this in terms of the balance of payments and the role of the central bank? Well, that gets us to this what's referred to as the government international reserves. So it turns out the change in this international the government international reserves is just going to be equal to the current account plus the capital account. Okay. Um, by the way, the government international reserves, that's also referred to sometimes as the official reserve transactions balance. And so the idea, the intuition behind this is such that it represents the net amount of international reserves that has to move between governments. In other words, it has to move between central banks in order to finance international transactions. Okay. So we're a country, we buy up a bunch of imported goods, um, we borrow abroad from capital markets to pay for some of that. The rest of the money has to come from somewhere. And so it comes from central banks, and that's what this is, um, this is about. And so to give you a, a simple example, um, if we had the current account uh, at minus 500 billion, so again, you can think of this as the trade deficit equal to 500 billion. Um, if the capital account is 400 billion, then that's, again, the idea is that, that we borrow 400 billion from uh, capital markets and international markets. Um, so where does the shortfall come from? Well, there's $100 billion that's missing in order to facilitate the $500, uh, $500 billion we imported. And so that comes from the central bank. And so the central bank draws down its international reserves by $100 billion. So the Fed would then give $100 billion to um, a foreign central bank in order to cover the shortfall between the capital account and the current account. And so the point of this is that these... Trade deficits, persistent trade deficits, can be problematic. Um, if we have current account deficits that are persistently negative, then that uh, represents the fact that uh, the central bank may need to intervene and draw down its international reserves in order to pay down um, those balances. And that um, also ties into this idea that it's not a sustainable process forever. And so, in effect, it represents a decline in net wealth of the domestic country relative to a foreign country, and that can be problematic for a lot of reasons, not least of which is the fact that it can lead to balance of payments crises, in which case you have the central bank running out of uh, international reserves to pay off these types of situations, and there's no ability to borrow in international capital markets. Thank you. <clears throat>